uh, Hillary has been lengthening her excuses as to why uh, she lost the election. She didn't really lose the election. It was stolen from her uh, by, I think it's up to 24 different excuses she has now. Number 24 is content farms in Macedonia. And uh, as I said, uh, my grandfather was a uh, Macedonian content farmer. And uh, we often think about, you know, gathering on the porch and recalling the old days on the Macedonian. I never thought, he never thought that the old content farmers he left behind in Macedonia would one day steal the U.S. presidential election. They are gnarled, hard-working Macedonian peasants. And the way they were able to reach out it is Easter Sunday in Macedonia that we are recording this episode 68 of the Macedonian Content Farmers podcast. Uh, we don't have a, a, a an open. We weren't uh, really feeling like uh, it would be appropriate for uh, a day like today in a time such as this in modern history. Um, but since it is Easter Sunday evening, I guess, uh, is, the, is the, the time that we're recording this. Svetin, how did you all spend your Easter there? Uh, under lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> Watching the procession on television. Um, some people were lighting candles on their windowsills. We had the, a nice procession in, uh, in the Bigurski Monastery, mm-hmm. uh, where they had the, the, ser- the Easter service. Uh, uh, quiet peaceful, detained, mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> housebound. Yeah. It, was, it was interesting. Yeah. Uh, a bit scary, a bit spooky, but uh, it's also the season that should renew our faith in, in good news that are coming. Absolutely, yes. Uh, the whole point of Easter is the resurrection, Christ conquering death itself. And if Christ can conquer death, which he did, then he can certainly do anything else and uh, get us... Yep. For those of us that are believers, at least, uh, you know, we, we have hope. Uh, for the unbelievers, uh, I don't know exactly how they get through this, to be honest. By snark. By snark. <laughs> uh, That's going to carry them for a little while, I guess. Yeah. You mentioned our, uh, our, in our pre, uh, pre-podcast conversation that uh, some of our friends on the left are not, um, we're, we're criticizing believers for being out on Thursday, is that right? Yeah, they wanted to have them arrested. Uh, the, the churches were, we were basically in lockdown since Friday uh, evening, mm-hmm. Friday afternoon, uh, Good Friday, in the, under the Julian calendar. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had, uh, on uh, Monday, Thursday, we had uh, a lot of people visiting the churches, taking the communion, and uh, uh, a lot, not that many. They, they were keeping, you know, mostly they were keeping uh, distance, uh, but they would use the same spoon for the communion. And uh, the left went ap- apoplectic. They wanted, uh, you know, to have the police shut down the churches oh. and uh, crack down on the on the faithful. The faithful would respond, "Listen, uh, we haven't figured out the." The supermarket situation, I mean, people are crowding in much worse conditions every day to buy necessities, and this is allowed, and, uh, uh, you know, if uh, people need to to cope with the, they need nourishment for their body, but also for their soul in this time, and if they want to take the communion, if it helps them at this time, it has, uh, haven't stopped doing it during the Ottoman slavery, and uh, <laughs> even during communist times, let alone uh, now, so this was the cultural rift we had uh, over the weekend. Now even one of the Albanian parties is demanding that uh, criminal charges are filed against the uh, the monks of the Bigorsky Monastery for having a mass event uh, with you know, dozen people. Yeah. Who? The Alliance Party. Okay, so Bessa. No, no, sorry. Uh, the, the Alliance. Uh, Alliance, uh, yeah. They they are they formally requested that the priests at Bigorsky be arrested. Yeah, I mean they're trolling as sure. usual. This is how they do politics. It's not like it's going to get anywhere. But uh, uh, it's uh, you know the Albanians they're uh, they're angry after the the riots in uh, Cinto in Sinjolic, yes. uh, a part of Skopje. We had uh, uh, it was apparently the SDSM party Albanians. Uh, in a part of Skopje, in the northeast of Skopje, they were having uh, 
what was it, Sunday, Monday, they had a couple of them out in the street, uh, you know, in violation of the curfew, they were arrested, mm -hmm. and immediately there was a huge uh, um, protest, uh, like dozens of Albanians got to the streets, they defied uh, the police, when they, they were told to disperse, it was, you know, the first major violation of the curfew we had in Macedonia, mm -hmm. And they threatened the local SDSM mayor, who is Macedonian, to uh, demanded that he releases the uh, three Albanians who were arrested. Uh, they were released afterwards, but now charges are filed against all those who got out in protest. And, you know, honestly, Albanians uh, and the left, which is now allied with them, and uh, I mean, they're even from the SDSM party, these people who were arrested and who were rioting with many pictures of them with uh, Stevo Pendarovsky, Zoran Zah. Whenever something crazy happens in this country, you can bet the perpetrator has a picture with Zah or Pendarovsky or, or Oliver Spasovsky. And, uh, you know, they were left with egg on their faces and they, obviously, the left had to keep quiet about this because uh, it upsets their uh, junior position in the coalition they have now. By now, the left is the junior partner in their in their own coalition, mm -hmm. easily, uh, to the Albanians. And, and then, you know, afterwards they came with... And, and of course, they have to be quiet over the uh, threat from the Grand Mufti uh, Rejepi, who was threatening to unleash the Muslim, uh, you know, to open the mosques every Friday and to use it as, uh, you know, staging ground. He said, unless you pay me, unless you give me money, uh, I will... Uh, reopen the mosques and he was he was paid we discussed this yeah. last episode <laughs> so the left i mean the church at least opened the churches for the service not not in a blackmail attempt <laughs> and <laughs> so the left had to be quiet over all of this so they, then they did what they can and lashed out where, where they can which is against the 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 christian faithful mm. which are you can still mock here with impunity yeah you know that actually i i gotta read this my uh, my sister sent me this um, the other day. It's uh, uh, fr from a book, uh, Letters to a Diminished Church by uh, Dorothy mm. Sayers, a British writer, uh, passed away in 57. She is basically the um, equivalent of uh, C.S. Lewis. Uh, okay. So, but I, I, and I've got to get this book. Um, this is fascinating, kind of along with what we're talking about right here. She writes, A young and intelligent priest remarked to me the other day that he thought one of the greatest sources of strength in Christianity today lay in the profoundly pessimistic view it took of human nature. There is a great deal in what he says. The people, this is important, the people who were most discouraged and made despondent by the barbarity and stupidity of human behavior at this time are those who think highly of Homo sapiens as a product of evolution and who still cling to an optimistic belief in the civilizing influence of progress and enlightenment. To them, the appalling outburst of bestial ferocity in the totalitarian states and the obstinate selfishness and stupid greed of capitalist society are not merely shocking and alarming. For them, these things are the utter negation of everything in which they have believed. It is as though the bottom has dropped out of their universe. The whole thing looks like a denial of all reason, and they feel as if they and the world had gone mad together. Now, for the Christian, this is not so. He is deeply shocked and grieved as anybody else, but he is not astonished. He has never thought very highly of human nature left to itself. He has been accustomed to the idea that there is a deep interior dislocation at the very center of human personality, and that you can never, as they say, quote, make people good by an act of parliament, unquote just because laws are man-made and therefore partake of the imperfect and self-contradictory nature of man. Humanly speaking, it is not true that, uh, it is not at all true that, quote, truly to know the good is to do the good, unquote. It is far truer to say with St. Paul that the evil I would not, that I do. So that the mere increase of knowledge is very little help in the struggle to outlaw evil. So, anyway, it's just, the, the point being that we as, as philosophical conservatives have a deeply pessimistic view of human nature and we know that the perfectibility of mankind is not possible whereas our friends on the left who we've just been talking about believe that with enough laws written by them and enough yeah. intervention by them and enough social engineering by them with them at the top they can make mankind perfect they believe 
human nature is malleable, it's plastic, and when we know it's unchanging. Oh. And so, to what Dorothy Sayers here writes, we're shocked too, but we're not surprised. We know this is to be expected. So, uh, yeah, the. Uh we were able to witness them I mean, the, in the scramble for toilet paper and food, you know, people... Uh, it was every man for himself, you know, and, uh, and uh, we discussed uh, some developments in uh, ostensibly leftist mayors in, uh, across Macedonia as soon as a village. Usually, uh, you know, if it's like Ohrid uh, and a Muslim village next to Ohrid, uh, the mayor and the people of Ohrid demanded uh, the city borders are closed. Same thing happened in Prilap. Uh, they would turn back. The hospitals would turn back patients, which they would suspect of uh, having the virus, but especially if they come from out of town. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, then we have, uh, you know, under lockdown, uh, there is a very sharp difference between uh, established families and these um, either singles uh, or uh, people still living, you know. Elder, uh, adult people still living with their parents. Mm. Uh, <laughs> they keep snarking at, at the family, saying, "Well, you will get divorced by, by the end of the <laughs> of the crisis." They ho they believe that if they have a you know, trouble having a relationship, everybody else does. So it's a it's a sharp divide. You could you could sense uh, in how we how the two political ideological sides uh, approach the virus. But then there is some reversion to uh, family life, everybody's cooking, everybody's, uh, you know, uh, at least uh, saying that they can care of each mm -hmm. other, looking at after each other. So uh, people are being brought back to the basics, uh, which I guess they uh, unlearned. Good, yeah. Um, you know, we've, we, and we've talked about this before, how, at least here in, in the Tucson area, a lot of people are, are buying from restaurants takeout and, mm. and uh, delivery because they want to support uh, the restaurants here and it's a different culture there and, and folks are doing more cooking at home and obviously our hearts go out to the, the, the men and women that work at the restaurants and the owners and the cooks and all mm. those that have lost their jobs. I don't know if the Macedonian state is going to do anything to help them. Uh, I've got a couple of favorite restaurants there in Skopje that I, I do hope <laughs> are open when I return, maybe later this summer I'll we'll have a chance to do that. Mm. Um, but uh, I'm putting forward an initiative just today that we open the restaurants and cafes as mini markets because, uh, you know, the, as it was evident during the discussion over the churches and, uh, you know, the supermarkets have far, far more people milling through there. So you can catch it in a high density mm -hmm. building uh, at the elevator, at the entrance, and you can catch it at the supermarket. These are the two points of, uh, or if you go to the doctors, you know, if you have to go, yeah. that's the first place. Uh, and, you know, if you could just, we have so many restaurants closed, they have the staff, they have the fridges, I mean, they could just, you know, sign a contract with the local supermarket uh, to deliver, you know, to have uh, some of their merchandise uh, on display and sold at uh, a shuttered uh, restaurant or cafe with some division of profits and then the government paying up the rest. And this would, uh, I mean, there's really no sense in 5,000, 10,000 people going through the same supermarket at this time, if we could disperse this uh, throughout, uh, you know, with online purchases, mm -hmm. but also with, you know, we're still not, even I haven't done any online purchasing yet. But, so if, if we can disperse this uh, using the shuttered restaurants and cafes, we might, uh, you know, change the food distribution um, system. Well, sure, actually, I mean... Here in Arizona, I know in a number of other states, uh, restaurants, uh, at least here, have a different supply chain than the grocery stores and the supermarkets. So they're buying their food mm. in bulk from other uh, companies. And, they're, and again, they're buying in bulk, and not just food, but paper products and everything else. And so the governor mm. here signed a law stating that essentially the restaurants can act as grocery stores. And if you want to buy yep. 50 pounds of beans, dry beans, uh, that mm -hmm. the restaurant has already purchased, you know, then you can do it from them. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So, uh, Excellent. you know, people are coming up with different creative ways to uh, support each other. Uh, I don't particularly mm -hmm. eat out a lot when I'm here, so what I do is I go down to my brewery and I buy a case of beer from them <laughs> instead of going to the grocery store and buying it. So, uh, you know, we're all, we're all trying to figure out how to support each other one way or the other. 
Um, no, but this is great. People figured it out in your country. Mm-hmm. I mean, here we are more top down, yeah. and we are in the best of hands. Obviously, we are led by the smart yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to the point that everybody from our, uh, most of our leaders are in quarantine. Well, right let's now. Yeah, let's, let's <laughs> talk about uh, the wisdom of the state. Uh, when oh, I say God. the state, I mean the government in Macedonia. Oh, so, Oliver Spasovsky is in lockdown, self quarantine, right? Mm. Okay, yeah. uh, who else? Uh, more importantly, Vinko Filip to the healthcare minister who is actually running the, the show and appears to be a, a bit more competent than Spasovskis, who is the interim prime minister. But, uh, uh, and and Buya Rosmani, he is the deputy prime minister and he was in charge of uh, you know, coordinating the aid effort. Uh, so uh, they are all under uh, lockdown, as well as uh, the education minister whose department as we discussed before, it has the most changes right. to organize and implement at this moment, getting the children to study from home. And this was this all happened because they they had the bright idea of going to Kumanovo, which is the worst right. affected city at, at the moment in Macedonia, and attending a local crisis center meeting to just show like a, a show of support to the city because they couldn't quarantine it because they are not capable of doing this. And they should have because it's spreading like like wildfire there. So they instead they decided to go for a visit. And the next day, the mayor of Kumanova, who was chairing this meeting, says, "Oh, by the way, I was tested like five days ago, and the result just came back positive. <laughs> and now the entire leadership of the country is in uh, lockdown wow. at home. They're self-isolating. And uh, not to mention that uh, uh, the, the leaders of the two main parties were just released after a week of lockdown uh, a few days mm-hmm. ago." Is there any way that, that, since the current leadership of the government of Macedonia is in lockdown, is there any way to continue that lockdown indefinitely <laughs> for them? <laughs> well, I mean, many of them should be locked down, locked up, uh, uh, no, corona yeah. or no corona. I mean, uh, there is enough material for all of them to be locked up, definitely. But, uh, uh, yeah, we should get to look into Well, that. I suppose it's too early to talk about elections. Today, we're recording this on Sunday, Easter Sunday, April 19. Elections were originally supposed to be held last Sunday, April 12. Uh, mm. And I, I suppose there's, it's it's just too early to talk about elections there, eh? Yeah, I mean, politics have stopped. I mean, we're just handling this thing. And the government was very, you know, out, out of the gate saying how competently they handled the virus, po- pointing out pictures of, uh, you know, graphs of death rates in Italy and elsewhere. And they were very smug. Mm. They were very self-assured at, at start, several press conferences led by Filip Cha, the healthcare minister. But then as the numbers got progressively worse, they stopped doing this. Now that, you know, I don't think any other country managed to get half of its government uh, to have to quarantine after this really unnecessary, pointless, uh, empty gesture they were making to the city of Kumanov in, you know, in, in lieu of actual help. And the numbers have been spiraling out of control. We now have, like, depending on how many tests they manage to conduct in a day, we have over 100 confirmed cases mm. daily. We broke this uh, this barrier last week. Uh, I mean, mm. this week, later, uh, late this week. And... Uh, uh, depending on how you count, the mortality rate is the worst in the Balkans. Uh, we have the most deaths per million. We have 51 or 52 so far confirmed mm-hmm. cases on very modest, uh, like median for Balkans right. testing. So this means that a lot of cases were not, who were likely, you know, coronavirus deaths were not uh, spotted and were, you know, the people were buried without autopsy and without checking them after they died. Uh, and, you know, Slovenia only does worse, but Slovenia had almost 10 times more testing than we did. They like they do this one of these mass testings. So obviously their numbers are horrific compared to the rest of the Balkans, but that's just because they have a more accurate picture. While we have, um, compared to countries who have done uh, less testing than we did, compared to countries who have done the same amount of testing, more testing, we have the worst numbers in mortality rates uh, absent uh, Slovenia and we haven't been able to you know tap these sources of international assistance Serbia does great here they get a lot of assistance from both the east and the west Russia uh, China and the EU and the US are lining up who will provide more 
visible assistants because they're playing both sides. We play one side and this one side delivers next to nothing. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, the aid came from uh, Hungary and uh, uh, the Visegrad countries and Slovenia and then eventually something from the Czech Republic, which the, and the U.S. ambassador was so angry here. She, had to, she also had to do some visible, like we ordered some masks from a, a, a hospital, from a textile mill in Prilep should have them delivered, and this was also the same day when uh, the government went to Kumanova, so the actual leader of the country, the U.S. ambassador, she should also be self-quarantining, and she's actually, she, she is not leaving the residence, apparently. She's not <laughs> so in the residence? We, um, in in wow. her home. She's, uh, I, I see her posting like video messages every other day to remind us that, okay, we're still in, I mean, the embassy is still in charge of the country, <laughs> etc., congratulating to the first responders, like really statesman-like yeah. messages, like stay at home, uh, congratulate all your firemen and uh, uh, nurses and doctors and whatnot, I'm here with my husband and my dog and blah, 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 uh, but it's all, all in the residence, right. in her house, so I guess she's also self-isolating, especially after she went out for this stupid uh, aid uh, distribution, she didn't have a mask. And Filipcha didn't have a mask on the picture, and it was the same day when uh, uh, when uh, the rest of the government had this meeting in Kumanova. So, <laughs> I mean, mm. the same people, essentially. So. Well, and, and, yeah. and so two points. Um, I was listening to a, um, actually watching a video on YouTube uh, yesterday with uh, Douglas Murray, the British uh, writer and uh, philosopher, uh, conservative, just, mm. I think, one of the more brilliant minds among us today. And uh, his uh, he was asked the question, you know, kind of what do you predict going forward and and he had the best answer he thought I thought and he said well you know it would be almost impossible to make predictions at this point and what we need is a, a large dose of humility and we've got to be humble about this and mm. to your point about the government being overconfident there at the beginning uh, we just have no idea um, you know I'm I as a conservative and as a skeptic of government and media in general um, you know, I have my, my doubts about all this, and, and the experts, uh, you know, are, are not above reproach either. They need to be questioned as well. Um, and they themselves have admitted, you know, Dr. Fauci, uh, being the, the foremost here in the United States, who enjoys a 77% approval rating, uh, you know, he, has, he himself has admitted that, you know, he was wrong uh, back in January. And so, you know, the ex now. At the same time, of course, the experts, you know, this is a brand new virus and they can only work with the data they've got, and the information they have. So, so it's, it's a huge dose of humility is needed amongst all of us. Um, you know, we're certainly not uh, virologists and epidemiologists, although it's amazing mm -hmm. the number of people that have come out of the woodwork who claim to be uh, professionals in that yeah. those subjects are nowadays. Uh, but... Yeah, I play one on Twitter every day. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, you know got to be reasonable, we've got to be balanced, uh, as, as we all know, as we've talked about, as the government and everybody else keeps talking about, that the economy, speaking globally, can't take this much longer, uh, and a global mm. depression will be worse than the virus. Uh, or So, you know, and we're already talking here, I know that some of the European Union states are talking about doing small measures and reopening certain things, I think I just saw something yeah. on that. The news this morning that Germany is going to open up, I think, bicycle shops and bookstores, uh, which, mm -hmm. uh, which is interesting. I didn't know if people still went to bookstores. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, bicycle shops never never should have been shut down in the first place. I mean, this is the whole thing about setting your government yeah, shutting exactly. down entire parks. A park, by the very definition, is a wide open space where you can socially distance. There's no reason to be shutting yeah. down parks. Um, and the alternative to having a bike, even for me sometimes, is taking the bus. And the bus is the worst thing you can the take. Bus, the bus, the tube, the underground, the subway, the car, exactly. but yeah. So, you know, so I don't know. The governor's here talking about, uh, you know, opening and phases and things like that, of course. Um, is there any talk there in Macedonia about any type of reopening of anything or at least stopping this... Mm -hmm this madness of a complete lockdown. You're, I think we should remind folks that right now you are in the middle of an 85-hour total lockdown. You can't leave your mm -hmm. bloody homes. 
uh, I'm surprised you're allowed to go out on your balcony because, you know, if you cough on your balcony, then the, you know, whatever it is that comes out of your lungs might, you know, disperse to the balcony right next to you. Um, uh, so, is there any... Yeah, you know, some people are daring the curfew to violate the curfew to throw their trash from their house, which, uh, I mean, it should, it, it's probably is not sanitary to keep a... I have now a big brown bag in my kitchen of trash, which I still haven't shown out. I'm thinking about maybe violating the curfew tomorrow because, you know, what it's 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 also not no. very sanitary <laughs> to do that. <laughs> and last weekend, the first time we had this uh, this large, long weekend, long lockdown, um, people were throwing the trash out, but the city was not collecting it. <laughs> so you you can't imagine the sight and the smell when uh, on the Monday oh. after the. Palm yeah. Sunday weekend here, lockdown. We, we got out and our neighbors were apparently throwing the trash out and it was all there. It was horrific. It, uh, you know, the, uh, such incompetence from the, from the local authorities. It was unimaginable. And yeah, people are still talking about tightening uh, the screws. So now there is talk of, uh, uh, Shekirinska mentioned uh, a two-week-long lockdown for everybody. Seriously? Like, like we now have three, three days now. She's talking about uh, 14 days. Uh, this is the time when in which you develop symptoms. So essentially, if we lock down everybody, then everybody would either have the symptoms or not have the symptoms, and then we'll be released. But what good will that do? Because we're just delaying the acquiral of herd immunity right. uh, on one hand. But uh, they, they're getting a, a power uh, crazy here. Uh, on the other hand, Spasovsky from his lockdown. He sent out a tweet that uh, he's looking into carefully, gradually opening the economy, as you asked, and then he managed to have the, the tweet misspelled. So it's, it's not very confidence-inducing. Uh, uh, <laughs> the word seriously was misspelled. So, like, guys, we don't have the best people uh, wow. around this. Well, why, why is... Um, when did Shekhanenska, who... Listeners probably know as the defense minister, what prompted her to suggest a two-week total lockdown, you can't leave your homes upon pain of death? Uh, I mean, they're discussing this. This was like uh, semi-leaked from the uh -huh. government, like uh, that she, they discussed this at the meeting of the, uh, and, and then, you know, the healthcare minister, I think he was asked about this, and he said, yeah, it's been considered, but it's not something... We have still decided to do, but yeah, like most of Europe is talking about gradually leaving the lockdown. We are still discussing uh, making matters worse. We have uh, uh, so one city was in quarantine, but it's a small city, ten thousand people, yeah. Debar. It was one of the first hardest hit, and it was completely locked down. And the government, no, nobody could leave the city and the near, nearby villages, and the government was providing them. Uh, food, medicine, you know, uh, delivery at home. But you can just about do it in a city of 10,000. Uh, Kumanovo is now mm -hmm. the worst hit. A a and Debar, it has burned out. By now there are no new cases, and Debar is considered that they have acquired collective immunity. They had like uh, five, ten deaths, mm -hmm. I think, uh, and uh, they're considered to have finished. Uh, the ep epidemic there is considered, you know, it's probably the safest place to be in the whole of Macedonia now. Kumanovo has a huge surge, more than 300 cases. The mayor there infected the government. Uh, Prilep is gaining on them. Prilep was, we discussed it in the podcast. Mm -hmm. They were initially demanding a lockdown against two neighboring municipalities. Uh, when I said these are the first signs of inter-ethnic, inter-religious, uh, you know, city-state actions, like we're going to lock down, we're going to use the local police to close the door for the neighboring village, which has a lot of people flying in from Italy and uh, they're not being, you know, they're not taking precautionary measures. So Prilap is also gaining on them, again, a city of 100,000. You can't lock down Kumano and Prilap, we can't supply them. We still need them to get out and buy their own medicine, food, we need the supermarkets to operate, the government does not have the manpower. To do this, it would have to recruit manpower from across the country to drive in trucks if we close the cities. And uh, so they basically gave up on this. And uh, 
are going for PR and to just trust like here we go to a visit to Kumanova and we all get infected. And it doesn't help that Spasovsky and the mayor of Kumanova there from the same party, from the same branch, you know, Spasovsky is also mm -hmm. from Kumanova, but they hate each other. So, you know, there was one, uh, even the mayor was saying, I'm left here, hung out to dry. I'm not getting the needed resources. And he was essentially saying, Shekarinsky and Spasovsky are sabotaging me. And, uh, and now the media, the SDSM media, the parties, apparently more interested in turning the blame on the mayor of Kumanova for infecting the government than on actually doing something. So, yeah, this is where we are right now. And Shekerinska is also giving her contribution. She posted, you know, on Easter we uh, paint the eggs and we break them and, uh, uh, you know, uh, on, uh, on midnight and then, uh, you know, it's the symbol of rebirth, etc. So Shekerinska, she posted a picture of several eggs one of them was painted like the coronavirus. What? And and one was apparently like a superhero with the, the European Union flag, like Captain Europe. And she said, she had some horrible comment like, well, superheroes need help, our help to fight the coronavirus or something. And, and this was the today and everybody is uh, unloading on her on the social media like, do you even have a sense of, of uh, uh, we would say, do you, do you have any... I mean, she's, she's uh, famously uh, yeah. tactless when it comes to such things. I mean, she went uh, during the floods in, uh, in Skopje in 2016, she went to the house where a person had died and uh, uh, the bereaved widow, she's at the door and uh, Shekerinsky is going in and she says, my husband died and... Shekerinska responds, don't, he doesn't have to get up, let him stay there, I'm, like, don't, don't uh, I, I'm very important, I'm coming to see you, but you don't have to all stand up and welcome oh me, it's fine. No, no, he died. Oh, yeah, she had a, yeah, I think, uh, who did that in the US? It was uh, uh, Joe Biden, I think, he, he, he asked one guy to stand up and <laughs> he's in a wheelchair. <laughs> so Shekerinska is, is the same. <laughs> so, yeah, we are... It's, you know, dark humor. I actually appreciate a little dose of dark humor in these days. I think it's going to help us, but uh, uh, it's also the people who are running the show right now, and it's not... Well, out. yes, and as we, I think, talked in the last podcast and before that, you know, post this, whatever that means, whenever whenever a either a vaccine is created or there is enough treatments to treat those who are sick so that you know, the number of deaths slows down and the length of hospital stays is decreased, and etc. Um, and, and things get back to a little bit of normalcy. Um, mm -hmm. The recriminations against politicians and bureaucrats and unelected diplomats and, and others and the lawsuits, especially in the United States, which is a litigious nation, uh, that's going to be breathtaking to watch just from a sociological standpoint i think uh because you know I, you know to be fair government officials are, are most i think are trying to act in good faith um some uh are um getting uh, dopamine hits from being able to shut down entire parks because uh mm -hmm. they have low self-esteem and now they've got a little bit of power and they can shut down a park and they feel important and da 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 da, da. so uh I can I can understand where where a government official gets out of hand on one occasion and, and does something stupid like tries to arrest somebody for going out and playing uh, t ball with their son at the park, mm. um, but if they do it again, then they need to be fired. Uh, yeah. So yeah. you know, again, you know, just common sense has got to prevail in this, and common sense with humility, uh, and it's, it's, you know, I think we see that a lot of people actually lack that. I mean, they were angling for something like this. This is what nerves me. I mean, if you look at Greta, it was a huge power grab, attempted power grab on a flimsy excuse, uh, you know, pseudo-scientific excuse, uh, let's control the entire energy sector uh, from private hands. Uh, uh, the migrants, it was a significant power grab with no good explanation why would countries which are 
you know, technologically advanced, can replace manual labor very easily, require an influx of immigrants, and we were not given an answer. They, and this is another, we discussed good things that could come out of this if we manage to revamp the education system and, you know, my uh, brilliant new idea of food distribution mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, deurbanization, you know, decluttering the cities. But just as easily they're going to abuse it. I mean, I don't think we've discussed this before. Uh, I think, I'm not sure if you caught this. One of the forms of assistance by the U.S. government, which was now much tooted, and even Secretary Pompeo tweeted about this in response to Oliver Spasovsky. They're clutching at straws to say, look, we provided this or that for this or that country, uh, and hoping Trump doesn't notice and then require, send these masks back. So uh, they're trying to do something to show that the U.S. is helping. So the ambassador goes out, works with the government, with a software company, and they now have an app which I can download on my phone. And I'm supposed to leave the Bluetooth on, and it's tracking me wherever I go. And it's uh, crisscrossing this with everybody else So uh, who, who has this thing downloaded. So if I catch the virus tomorrow, uh, the government will ask me for my phone number, they're going to run it through the service. They're going to map out my locations, my movements over the past two weeks during the, let's say, incubation period. And they're going to get everybody else who has the same application. Uh, if uh, some of them has been in close proximity to me, uh, let's say more less than a meter, let's say in the same elevator or, you know, walking uh, in the same aisle in the supermarket, so they're going to call them, they're going to text them, they're going to say, listen, you've been in the supermarket on this day, and there, the person who was also buying pasta next to you, he now has the virus. So you have been, so besides, you know, obviously they're going to inform my family and co-workers if I go to work, but this would also map out my movement. And they knew, and they knew you were buying and, pasta. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, they call it the Stop Corona uh, app. I call it the Stop uh, uh, Infidelity <laughs> app. But um, and you know, I tweeted out. Okay, I understand how this could be useful. Also, this is a government which grabbed power by illegal yep. wiretapping and lied to everybody about it. It's being co-developed with the U.S. The U.S. embassy here showed that they're willing to lie about e about every step of the. Uh, you know, regime removal and uh, replacement process uh, to get there. Their... So probably you are not the best persons to be, you know, the embassy and the government to be mm -hmm. pushing this. I advise them, listen, you probably have the technology anyway, just do it, don't tell us, just, you know, right. just do it. Just uh, act like the, you know, the magician who just texts people at random and tells them, you go check yourself. Um, I mean, there, it is possible to, to run metadata on, uh, on phones. I'm sure te te it's technically easy to do. The app is just the front end of the uh, process. And uh, this would be one of the power grabs, which I'm, I'm, I'm actually pretty certain they're doing it now. And the app would mostly be an excuse uh, to say, well, listen, you download it yourself. Uh, it's now on the App Store, it's like in the tens of thousands of downloads, or 10,000 plus. I, I think it counts like over 50 or over 100, then the numbers move. So very few people have downloaded it so far. So now the government has a new uh, initiative. They're going to advise, I'm making yes. quotation marks with my fingers, or encourage, <laughs> double quotation marks, public sector employees to download the map and use it. So now the next step is... Uh, we're putting a GPS, I mean, we have a GPS tracker on us, but now we are officializing the fact that uh, the government is using our phones as, uh, GP for GPS tracking, and the U.S. ambassador is overjoyed that she provided this helpful tool, and people are, you know, we are having a sense of American style, hell no, you can't have my geolocation <laughs> data uh, approach to this from many people online, and some are like me, you know, I'm just reluctantly not using this because uh, I'm, you know, not with this government and not with this. Wow. Place. Now, that is, I did not know that, or I might have just seen that and skipped over it, but thank you for explaining that to listeners and to me. Um, and the what's the call again? 
Stop Corona. And it's an app that was jointly developed by... Uh, next sense, uh, a software company here did it, but you know the yeah. U.S. embassy and the government they were very big on this, and then the government expressed its gratitude to Pompeo, and Pompeo retweeted it back. Thank you, we're glad to be helping. And like okay, this is a very abusive government uh, towards its political opponents. Uh, you shouldn't be giving them additional Look, things. I mean, not even under these circumstances. I, I I get it. What you and you just said it yourself that you know I can understand how this could be helpful and keeping track of the virus and things like that. But you and I both know that it won't be limited to that. And yeah. so, so actually, here's a question to ask uh, Madam Ambassador and your government there. Is that once this whole thing is over, will this app be discontinued? Will the software be dismantled? Will the information that has been collected be destroyed? What would be the point of this app <laughs> yeah, right. and all that information after this is over? Now, I can see where some would say, you know, well, we have to wait until there's a vaccine. So that's, you know, 18 months, two years. So mm. we have to have it in the meantime. I mean, we know as, as practical uh, conservatives, philosophical conservatives, that when government gets this kind of information and technology and power, it never lets go and it will abuse it eventually. Uh, that because that is going back to what we talked about earlier. That is human nature. Um, this will be abused, uh, and will have negative consequences for the uh, the rights of uh, individual Macedonians and wherever else this type of software is being used. Because I know it's being used in Asia. Uh, but um, mm. yeah, you can you can have my uh, what is it, what's it called geo. Geolocation. Well, geolocation. You can have my, geolo you can, you can have my geolocation when you come and pry it from my cold, dead hands, uh, to paraphrase a Charlton Heston mm -hmm. on uh, National uh, Rifle Association. Um, there is just... I, I, I don't trust government, period. Um, yeah, yeah, of course. Especially one which has Zoran Verushevsky as National exactly. Security so, Advisor. I, I think, though, but that is something worth exploring, is, is asking those questions. Um, and of course, what they're going to—they're not going to answer them, or they're going to say, "Well, it's too early to say," and yeah, it will be delay, 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 and, um, and and it's a matter. Now, this is something, Svetin, that I think our friends on the left—and I'm using air quotes for friends—would uh, be uh, worried about there in Macedonia, you know, civil rights and uh, government surveillance and things like that. I mean, we've seen many cases here where the uh, ACLU, for instance, the American Civil Liberties Union. Has joined with those of us on the right when it comes on the right when it comes to privacy and security of uh, uh, privacy and security concerns. Um, I'll be very interested to see if our friends on the left there uh, decide to uh, raise their voices about this violation of individual rights. But maybe they don't care about rights. No, some of them, some of them obviously who support the government, they are tweeting in the context of, well, you don't want to download the app. Fine, well. This is why you uh, you will be kept under lockdown for longer because if you download the app, we will have the data and we will be able to release you from your curfew sooner. <laughs> but now you don't want to do it. You know, there's I've seen tweets in this Seriously. along these lines. Well, fine, it's your fault that we are. Give me their names. Yeah, well, uh, you have to look them up. I mean, I, they're just like a blur to me. The pro is the SM government tw Twitter trolls, but this is going to be a talking point. It already so. is. We're talking about it now. Um, you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago uh, science. I've forgotten what context already. But it just reminded me, yesterday I was listening to um, uh, the Commentary Podcast, which is a commentary magazine, John mm -hmm. Doritz and others. It's, uh, you know, they opine about uh, current events in politics from a, not just from a conservative standpoint, but from a Jewish conservative standpoint, which I find fascinating. It's excellent. Mm -hmm. And um, they had a uh, guest on um, uh, Sohar Bamari. Uh, who we're familiar with, the uh, editor of the New York Post, and uh, an article that he just wrote for commentary called They Blinded Us with Science, which is a brilliant title take off mm -hmm. on the, um, um, oh dear, he was the 80s. Uh, the yeah, blinded me. Who's the, yeah, I forgot the artist. Um, terrible. Uh, yeah, my I've got it here over here <laughs> on my uh, my rack of CDs. I'm, I'm old-fashioned. I have CDs. Um 
But but they got into this whole discussion of science and how it relates to what we're all talking about now on the coronavirus, etc. And so many, and I, I got to thinking, so many people put absolute and total faith in science, which is a form of idolatry. You know what idolatry is? Idolatry is putting anything above God. It's it's putting your faith in mm -hmm. in w whether it's the government or science or yourself or your spouse or your job or anything else. It's putting putting your faith in that and and putting that above God. And and that's what I think a lot of people are doing, unfortunately, uh, to the exclusion of, of uh, all else. All right. Yeah, they were prepared to follow a. Uh... 16-year-old Swedish girl well, should, braids. Uh, shouldn't she be happy uh, right now? There's no pollution the anymore. Because everybody, yeah. the economy's destroyed yeah. and everybody's in their homes. Kids are not going it, to school. Yeah, <laughs> yeah th this, is what it, uh, yeah. this is what she wanted, yeah. Th this is why, like, she tweets now, but she's what? old news. She's no longer, you know, she... This is the problem with uh, these types of Joan of Arc people. Once they uh, accom accomplish their mission, was their... Future purpose. Yeah. <laughs> no, what's Although future John of Arc was a believer, and Greta, I can assure you, was an atheist. So. Uh. Oh yeah, sure. Oh, good thing nobody's suggesting we, we burn somebody at the stake to to defeat the coronavirus. <laughs> yes. Yet, I mean, it's still early. To, to, to well, get at, there, but. at the rate some of these totalitarian authoritarian governments are moving, that might yet be the case. Mm. Yeah, burn the uh, Corona app non-downloader. Yeah. Well, that stake. I think. Um, that's a good way to end this podcast on this Easter Sunday um, with a warning. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how many downloads they have next the week this time when we record this and <laughs> what the government is going to do with that information. And, and for the future, seeing uh, if they're going to, what they're going to do with this app, uh, you know, long term and the information. Yeah. Yeah, we'll always find the middle way, like download it on one phone and then leave it at home. <laughs> well, that goes back to uh, President Harry Truman here uh, said, if you can't convince them, confuse them. Yeah, well, we have a good lot of experience with fighting totalitarian governments. We just repeat the old story with uh, new Very technology. Good. Well, that yeah. we will uh, be monitoring. So, uh, good. Um, it's uh, about 10 p.m. there. you got to few more hours in this Easter Sunday, so um, I hope that uh, you and your family are safe and healthy and stay safe and healthy. Thank you, thank you. Hope you, you enjoy your semi-confinement. Uh, you're, you're still, we're actually no, not confinement we, at all there. I mean, right? I, I go out, actually, you know, next week we're going to have to uh, figure out a different time for the this podcast because I am going on a uh -huh. three-day, two-night, overnight hike up in the mountains with... Uh, brother law and friend yeah, yeah well, rub it in rub it yeah. in sure uh <laughs> so that'll be friday saturday sunday and uh, uh up in the mountains which uh, uh i can assure you that the top of the, the peaks there it's corona free um yeah and the gps that's true yeah, i want a cell phone probably. contact there so uh, anyway we'll have to figure that out next week yeah. so <laughs> until then well perhaps absolutely. some fresh air for me <laughs> you too okay take care buddy